Good day, friends. Today, we are looking at a message titled Shibboleth. Shibboleth. The background of the story is found in Judges chapter 11 and the actual incident in Judges chapter 12. It was the year 1981. I walked into a friend's house and they had a Ripley's Believe It or Not book which was half torn, the first half was torn off. So the first open page had this believe it or not point that I read. It said, believe it or not, 42,000 men were slain because they could not properly pronounce one particular word. I said, I don't believe it. And then it gave a reference from the Bible. So that forced me to start to do some research on it. And so here we are. Now let's go to Hebrews chapter 11 for a little, uh, not Hebrews, Judges chapter 11 for a little background here. Now Jephthah, he's the key player in this incident. Jephthah the Gileadite, his father's name was Gilead, was a mighty man of valor. This is Jephthah. And he was the son of an harlot. His mother was, in another part of scripture, a strange woman. And Gilead begat Jephthah. Gilead was his dad. And Gilead's wife had other sons for him. And as the boys grew up, they thrust out, pushed out Jephthah and said to him, you will not inherit any part of our father's house because you are the son of a strange woman. Then Jephthah left his brothers and dwelt in the land of Tob. And there were gathered men to him. And it came to pass, after some time, the children of Ammon, Ammonites, in just a little history. Today it's Amman. Amman is the capital city of Jordan. So the Ammonites declared war against Israel. And it was so when the children of Ammon came to make war against Israel. These other sons of Gilead who had thrust out Jephthah, they went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. They said to Jephthah, Come, be our captain, that we may go fight against the Ammonites. And now you can understand how Jephthah feels about it. Jephthah says, verse 7, Judges 11, verse 7. He says to the elders of Gilead and his brothers, Did you not hate me and expel me from my own father's house? And why are you come now to me for help when you are in distress? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, Yes, we return to you now, that you may fight alongside us against the Ammonites. And we ask you, we would make you head over all of the clan of Gilead. Very important. Follow these thoughts. And Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, If you bring me home again to fight against the children of Ammon, and God delivers them, gives me the victory, you will make me your head, your leader. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, the Lord be witness between you and us if we do not do this according to your words. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and captain over them. So this is the introduction to Jephthah. By the way, he is also included in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. His name is found in verse 32. So who is this man Jephthah, named with these famous others as Moses and Joshua? Jephthah's name is included. So we see now he was a Gileadite. His mother was a strange woman, a harlot. And now I want us to read the incident in chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. So if you have your Bibles open to Judges chapter 12, Verse 6 verses. After Jephthah with his brothers and clansmen fights against the Ammonites, God gives them a wonderful victory. 
they come back with the spoils. To the victor belongs the spoils. Then, the tribe of Ephraim. So these are like their cousins. By the way, Gilead was like a large, significant clan who dwelt among the people of the tribe of Manasseh. And now, it's like their cousins, if you would. Another tribe of the same country of Israel, the Ephraimites, Judges chapter 12, verse 1. After Jephthah and the Gileadites win a victory over the Ammonites, the Ephraimites come gather together and came to Jephthah. And they said to Jephthah, Why did you go over and fight against the Ammonites without calling us? We will now burn your houses down over your heads with fire. Now what we did not read, and it's there in chapter 11, you can read it, that Jephthah actually sent a message to the Ephraimites. Would you like to join us? But the Ephraimites ignored his message. I'm sure we know the feeling. We send a message to someone, and it's fairly important, and we get ignored. So Jephthah was ignored. So he had to go with his Gileadites and fight against the Ammonites, and God gave them the victory. Now the Ephraimites, after ignoring his message, have the audacity to say to Jephthah, basically, how dare you go and fight against the Ammonites? You should have called us also. So we're going to come and burn your houses over your heads. Burn them down with fire. Wow. And Jephthah says to his cousins, fellow Israelites from the tribe of Ephraim, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon. And when I called you, you did not come to help deliver us out of their hands. So when I saw that you did not come, I took my life in my own hands. We passed over against the children of Ammon, and God delivered them into my hand. How dare you then come against me to fight against me this day? This is in Judges chapter 12. I'm in verse 4 now. Then Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead who were under him, his clansmen, and fought. This is a... Uh, mini civil war, a battle between the Gileadites and the Ephraimites, fellow Israelites. So Jephthah gathered the Gileadites for round two, a second battle. They've just defeated the Ammonites. Now they're fighting with the Ephraimites and the Gileadites defeated Ephraim. Verse five. And the Gileadites took the passages of the Jordan before the Ephraimites. The Gileadites lived east of the Jordan River and the tribe of Manasseh, and the Ephraimites lived west of the Jordan River. So when they defeated the Ephraimites, Gil uh, Jephthah got his men to guard the passages of the Jordan, because the Ephraimites, who were the losers in this battle, would try to pass back, either during the day or certainly at night. Now watch happens. Watch what happens. And the Gileadites took the passages of the Jordan River before the Ephraimites. And it was so that when those Ephraimites who had escaped, run away, fled, said, Let me cross over, that the men of Gilead said to them, Are you an Ephraimite? Now, of course, he's not going to say yes, because he's going to pay the ultimate price. So they lied and said, No, I'm not an Ephraimite. Verse 6 of chapter 12 of Judges. Then the Gileadites said to each Ephraimite, as they tried to come across, or group of Ephraimites, if you're not an Ephraimite, pronounce or say now the word Shibboleth. For the Gileadites knew among the Ephraimites, they had difficulty pronouncing the SH, SH, syllable. Instead, they would just use the S sound, S. If you're not an Ephraimite, say the word Shibboleth. They knew they could not, the Gileadites knew the Ephraimites would have trouble pronouncing it right. And when the man answered, he would say Sibboleth instead of Shibboleth because he could not properly pronounce it. Then the Gileadites took those Ephraimites and slew them at the passages of the Jordan River and there fell at that time of the Ephraimites 42,000. Now we've got the whole story. Please follow me. We've got the background. Jephthah was basically, originally, 
disinherited by his brothers. He is then recalled and he's made their leader. He sends a request to the Ephraimites who are their cousins, a neighboring tribe. That's ignored. And actually he also tries to negotiate with the Ammonites, but they would not hear of it. So they went to battle. God gives him victory, gives Jephthah victory. He is made the leader of the Gileadites. Now remember, Jephthah was rejected. He was sent out. Basically, get out. We don't want any part of you. Your mother's a strange woman by his own brothers. It's almost like he had the word reject stamped on his forehead. Have you ever thought like that, my friend? Whether it's a family member who's rejected you, a spouse, a child, a friend, a colleague at work, someone who's betrayed you, let you down. Maybe, sadly, sometimes it could be a parent or a teacher who said things like, you'll never amount to anything. And you felt like unwanted, that you would never achieve anything in life. Reject. Take heart. Remember this example, true life example of Jephthah. Maybe yours was an unwanted pregnancy. Wow. Maybe it was a lack of dyna dynamic personality. Maybe like me, you were just um, simple Simon or plain Jane. I was like, I hardly have any friends. Look at him. Look at her. They have a tremendous personality. Look at the friends they have. Maybe we did not do too well in school. Maybe we've experienced some failure at work or a business failure. And we felt like the word reject was stamped on our forehead. Remember God who turned a reject like Jephthah into the leader of his own people can turn your circumstances around and do the same for you. My friend, be encouraged. So now, the Ephraimites are angry with Jephthah and the Gileadites. They cannot share in the spoils. After they ignored his request for help, they threatened to burn their houses down. God gives Jephthah a second win. And as I said, the Ephraimites escape for their lives, but they've got to come back and cross the Jordan River to go home. Jephthah's men are guarding the passages of the Jordan. And what's the question, the test question they ask them? Are you an Ephraimite? And if they said no, then they would say, pronounce or say the word Shibboleth. And if you pronounce it fine, okay, you can pass. But if you blew it and said Shibboleth, you were done for. Now this is not really so unusual. In my community, it's very commonplace for members of my community to drop their H's where they are supposed to pronounce them and to add them where they are not supposed to. For example, you ask a young child, what did you have for breakfast? And the child may say something like this, we add eggs for breakfast. Instead of we had eggs, we add eggs. So don't be offended. We're not trying to pick on anybody. I'm just saying in my own community, that's a problem. In, in the nation of India, there's no W letter. There's a V. So I remember my one second language teacher. There's no W in their language. It's not their fault. So for the word W-O-U-N-D, the teacher said und, completely dropped the W. Or you listen to many folk here in the country, and this is not a slam, it's just they don't have that a letter in their language. They say, where are you going? Why did you do this? So a V replaces the W subconsciously. Uh, and I could give you examples from many other uh, countries, and <laughs> but some people tend to get offended. Please, come on, let's be a little tough. So, I want to give you a little demonstration as to how you can say how come such a big deal of a difference between shibboleth and sibboleth. Now here's a piece of paper. You would expect when I speak the word behind it, the louder I speak it, 
it should bend more away from me. And the softer I say it, it should still be straight, but not necessarily so. So watch this demo. I'll just take the word Papa. Okay, Papa! That was pretty loud. Now watch. Papa. Papa! Papa. You like that, right? You want to watch it again? Okay. Papa! Papa. It's how I roll my tongue in my mouth. How I breathe when I breathe. So certain communities in certain cultures and countries have difficulty with certain words. That's just the way it is. It's nothing to, to make fun of. It's just the way it is. So it's often difficult to differentiate between the genuine article, shibboleth, and the impersonator or the hypocrite, shibboleth. Both of them fellowship and worship, even do good works but for very different reasons. The one to draw nearer to God, to honor Him, to serve Him, to please Him, while the other does some of these things for self-acceptance, for reputation, for promotion, to please society and friends, for a good name. Now here's an amazing fact. Shibboleth is a real Hebrew word, remember the Old Testament, written in Hebrew. And it has two distinct meanings and another colloquial meaning. I'd like to add that in. So three meanings. The first is like a stream, flowing like a stream of water. The second is growing like an ear of corn. Both these are very important. Remember that. Flowing like a stream growing like an ear of corn. And the third colloquial meaning is glowing, like countenance shining. Let's look at this now. Sh they could not say shibboleth. Instead, they said sibboleth. Believe it or not, sibboleth is another Hebrew word with its own separate meaning. I've got to keep that for later. You'll be amazed at it. But let me give you one other example from the English language. The word S-U-R-E is pronounced sure with an H in it. Sure. But if someone does not put the H in their pronunciation, it becomes sewer. And sewer sounds like S-E-W-E-R. What a contrast in meaning from sure to sewer. So also with shibboleth and sibboleth. I haven't given you the meaning of sibboleth yet. Wait for it. So for the genuine, born-again, blood-washed, child of God, Christian, a person who's placed their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, life ought to be a shibboleth experience. Number one, if it's shibboleth, we ought to be like a stream flowing. Now a stream begins in the highlands, and as it courses down, it sparkles. It brings life and vibrancy to the flora and fauna on its journey or path. It's refreshing. It's life-giving. It imparts life and health and vigor. It seems to continue on endlessly, it seems. Lord Alfred Tennyson, a famous British poem, a poet, wrote a poem titled The Brook or stream. And the main line in that poem is about the stream talking. For men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. The stream seems to go on and on and on. So we are to be shibboleth Christians, flowing like a stream. By the way, there is a river that has its origin at the throne of God. And from there it flows down, coursing through the body of Christ. That is called the river of life. It's not a stagnant pond or pool. It's a river of life. You know, even a rough rock thrown into the stream, what happens over time to it? It becomes lovely and smooth. And many of us have had the experience of finding one, picking it up, bringing it home, and using it in our offices as a paperweight. But you wonder about some folk who are 
who've been coming to church for a while, you just come close by them and you get you get a scratch or cut. You have to wonder, how long have they been in the river? Has it not smoothed out those rough edges? My friend, get in the river and stay in the river and let the Spirit of God smooth out those rough edges. Jesus said in John 6, 38, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink, for out of his belly or innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. That's what our life ought to be like, friend, if we truly know the Lord Jesus as our Savior. The second meaning of shibboleth is growing like an ear of corn, not like a grain, single grain of rice or a grain of wheat, but a whole ear of corn. That's interesting. You probably know where we're going with this. Once a person has died to self and the old man has been buried, we then become born again, a new creation in Christ Jesus. So this new seed or new emerges into new life and a new way of living. But this birth being born again is just the beginning. We must grow, not only physically, obviously, but spiritually. We must grow. There need to be souls to our account, people we've impacted with our lives and with the gospel who've come to Jesus. We must grow spiritually. Imagine a couple has a baby, which is born apparently healthy and normal, but it just doesn't seem to grow. It's stunted. What would the reaction be as parents? Panic? Rush to a pediatrician? And maybe then some prayer? What is needed then for the number of infantile Christians who haven't grown up, who have become, who, or who are spiritually barren or spiritually impotent? And on the flip side, there are those who are spiritually obese. So much of the word, a glut of the word, but no life application. These are folk who attend church month after month, year after year, but there's no evidence of growth. How can one sing, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows, unless we are spending time with him in his word, in his presence, with his people? It's then as we grow and mature, we ripen and multiply. Now, the meaning, the second meaning, growing like an ear of corn. It's, an, it's a whole ear of corn. Question for you. How many kernels of corn do you think estimate are in one whole ear of corn? 400? 300? 500? Have you hazarded a guess? All right, here's the correct answer. Approximately 500 kernels of corn on each ear of corn. We are called to grow like an ear, ear of corn. That's amazing. That's the kind of growth and multiplication that God expects from us. We've got to stay connected to the vine people. And the third meaning, which is more colloquial for shibboleth, is glowing, shining, glowing. This should be true, especially in the case of every born-again Christian who has the Holy Spirit of the living God indwelling in us. I'd like us to consider the analogy of a solenoid. Every car... Uh, regular internal combustion engine has what's called a solenoid. It's like a piece of iron with a metal wire coil around it and the two ends of the wire plugged into a power source, whether it's the car battery or the alternator as it starts up. The moment that happens, when the electric current goes through that wire around the piece of iron, immediately the piece of iron turns into a magnet. The moment you stop the power source, the piece of iron is just a piece of flat iron. No magnetic properties at all. I like that example because we don't just have the wire cord around us. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. So what excuse for our countenance not to be shining, to be glowing with the presence of Jesus Christ? Hallelujah. 
You know, the Lord Jesus asked for a coin and said, whose inscription is on it? Question for us, whose image or superscription is on our face? I'm not talking about our personal appearance. What does the world see from the inside coming out of us? Whose image or superscription? Do they see anything of Christ? Even as Christ is the express image of the invisible God, so also we ought to glow with the image of the invisible Christ. Now, the Christian is supposed to be a shibboleth person, flowing like a stream, growing like an ear of corn, and glowing with the glory and light of Jesus Christ. The Ephraimites could not say shibboleth, what did they say when they opened their mouth to pronounce the word? It came out as Siboleth. Siboleth. The H was missing. Now I'm going to read this to you. Siboleth is another Hebrew word with its own meaning, meaning suffering, misery, endurance, hardship, affliction, torture. In one word, Siboleth means, I'm going to spell it for you. B U R D E N burden. Tell me your life is flowing like a stream, growing like an ear of corn, glowing with the life and the love of Christ. Sir, I'm a burden. Wow! 42,000 men lost their lives because of that. I'm a burden. The unsaved and the hypocrite come under this category. That includes the hypocrite, the wannabes, the pretenders. They're a burden to themselves, their families, community, society at large. The unbeliever tries to offload his burden by looking to society to help him and becomes a problem to the community and society at large. Why is it every genuinely, genuine born-again believer ought not to be a burden to community and society? Simple friends, because the day we encountered the crucified Christ at Calvary's cross, it was there that all our burdens rolled away. Hallelujah. Now, as we want to close, here's the difference. What is the difference between shibboleth and sibboleth? Only one letter is missing. The letter H. Let's look at seven quick H's. H stands for heirs. We are called to be heirs and joint heirs with Jesus. H stands for holiness without which the Bible says no one can see God. H stands for happiness. We have joy unspeakable and full of glory. H stands for hope. We have the hope of the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. H stands for harvest. The fields are ripe unto harvest, but the laborers are few. H stands for Holy Ghost, the dynamite power of God that enables us to bring in the harvest. H stands for heaven, eternity in the presence of our King. What more could one ask for? I've got to go to one line of a Christian song around the 80s or 90s. Heaven is being with you. There's nothing I'd rather do. Oh, friend, heaven is being with Jesus. Wherever Jesus is, that is heaven. Hallelujah. For me, this is a piece of heaven. He's right here in my little office with me. Hallelujah. Last but not least, H stands for one glorious, unending hallelujah that will ring through the courts of heaven for all eternity. So come on, let's be shibboleth Christians, flowing, growing, and glowing. God bless you.